Welcome to chapter 12 and the discussion around the concept of service quality. Now the key to this chapter is that service quality is predicated on a scale of five items. Those five items are measured pre-service in terms of expectations and post-service in terms of perceptions which means it is an operationalized version of the gap model of the expectation confirmation approach. So from a single fundamental idea, expectation versus perception and the difference between expectation and perception, the surf pole measurement is enacted so that you can assess different aspects of the service performance and the service delivery in order to understand what is causing that particular gap. Now it's important to understand that service quality is a separate element to customer satisfaction. Service quality is as close to objective as you're going to get in services marketing because what you're looking at here is the performance of the firm it is simultaneously performance driven, as in the firm has control over how the service is performed, but it's also heavily influenced by perception because this is services marketing. Customer satisfaction, on the other hand, we know has a lot of additional facets that are outside of the control of the service provider. Contextual issues, situational issues, character traits of the customer, temporary traits of the customer elements we can't address. But service quality are elements we can address and this is why we engage it and measure it. So the question that you also need to be considering as we're going through this is one of whether customer satisfaction creates a perception of service quality or service quality leads to customer satisfaction. Is the service good because I am satisfied or am I satisfied because the service is good? The answer is probably yes, both and no, but that's why questions like these make for wonderful things to debate. So, the conceptual model of service is quality. Now, Parashumanum, Zethamol and Berry created this particular framework and if you use a Zethamol driven textbook, it will be the core of that text. Here, Savuction, uh, this textbook is driven by Savuction. Other textbooks are driven by similar central core ideas. Now, the fundamental principle here in the service quality model is that there are five possible places that you can have a gap between the delivery of a service in terms of expectation and perception. So you'll see that the model has a range of variants in terms of the orders, the placement of the different boxes, but fundamentally gap one, the knowledge gap, is the gap between what the customer expects and what management thinks the customer will expect. This is the knowledge gap because you don't know your customer well enough. Gap two is the gap between what management thinks the customer wants and the standards management sets in terms of specifying service delivery. That creates a mismatch between objective and deliverable. That said, you can still have the standards that fit, that match. It is what the customer wants. You do know what the customer wants, but delivery may not be able to be realized. So gap three, the delivery gap, is the distance between what your standards say you will do and what you end up actually delivering. Gap four is an important gap because this is the communications gap. This is where advertising promotion can influence the service delivered and the customer's expectations of the service to be delivered. And the final element here is the gap between the perception and the expectation, gap five. Now in some models that gap does not make an appearance, 
Some versions of this is four gap, five gap. There are variations, variants to the theme, and this is also why citation footnoting is important, is that if you cite this model at five gaps and someone else is using the four gap model, it's vitally important that you are able to recognize, oh, hey, we're talking about the same thing, we're just using different versions of it. So let's go gap by gap on this one. Top of the line here, knowledge gap. Now, this requires solutions to the knowledge gap require market research. Uh, we think about uh, elements where the, ban the boundary spanners are knowing what the customer's needs are, but are unable to communicate that up to management. And management themselves being empowered to act on feedback from the front lines in order to deliver a change to the product quality, change to the value of the product. Gap two of the model is the standards gap. Now the standards gap is where you're going to see the separation between what management thinks that the customer wants and the standards that they set in order to deliver that. So this is going to be things around product design. It's going to be around service quality. It's going to be around staff training. It's going to be also around aspects such as the feasibility. Can the product offer actually be given to the market in the way management thinks the customer wants or thinks the customer will pay money for. Now there's a couple of these elements that are obviously uh, going to be a challenge here. Feasibility, uh, we run into that on a regular basis where someone promises something impossible to deliver. Uh, you're also looking at things like the conversion of quality to standards that early in the growth of a services provider, it may be enough that your frontline, your boundary spanner, your frontline staff member is also your product designer who is also management. It's a startup, it's custom, it's personal. The whole bespoke service delivery aspect means that you know your customer well enough to be able to set the standards and then deliver to those standards because all of that is internal. It's internalized knowledge that's built on your skill set. The challenge becomes when you try to convert a person or a personally delivered, personally designed service into something that's more standardized and we're talking here about setting specifications. We're talking about creating ways to measure that the product, the service product that you have designed gets delivered. There's a lot of the challenges around product development, product design, but also around the communication of what is the core service value. If you think about this, particularly from the idea of the three attributes, the search attribute-based service is going to be the easiest to communicate to a staff member because it's going to have the most overt features because they are observable, searchable, predictable. Moving to experiential, you will have to bring your services employees through the experience initially so that they can go and get a sense of the experience, then try to communicate the required elements, the component parts, the aspects of the service to your employees, then teach them how to deliver those components. And then in order to test that, you're going to have to go back through the service experience yourself, knowing that you won't be experiencing the service as a new to it customer because you're the person who built it and designed it. Finally, we get up to experiential services and boy, teaching experiential services is strange enough because experiential services, the service consumer doesn't know whether the service has been good or bad and doesn't have the skills to evaluate the service. 
So in one sense, it's possible that the credence-based service product can never be delivered as in training as a credence event because the people who will have the skills to evaluate it are the people who have created the product and are delivering the product. So credence, experiential-based, and search attributes, all of these aspects that make it difficult to communicate a service to a customer will also influence the creation of the standards and the communication of the standards between management and employee in terms of delivering the customer service. So the third gap on the list here, this is the gap between where standards are set and the actual service. Uh, we raised a few of these in the marketing mix element of people, where you're looking at uh, role conflict and role ambiguity. What is it that the job is asking me to do? How well does that fit my personal professional values? Does it fit my skill set? Do I know what my role in the service scape is? Do I have the ability to perform that role in the service scape? Am I the right fit for the job? And finally, do I actually have the willingness to perform? Remembering that willingness to perform can be a variable instrument. It can be influenced by situational factors. It can be influenced by temporary factors of injury or illness. It can be, you can be completely willing to perform but physically unable to do the job because of uh, temporary influence. So some of the delivery factors, if we go back also then look at the service scape, approach avoidant behavior in the service scape, we look at the service quality uh, frameworks. Employees are as, because employees are humans in skill-based environments, the facets and factors that will influence someone's consumption of a service can also impact on their ability an individual's ability to deliver the service. If the service scape is non-conducive to service delivery, that's going to pose a challenge for customer and client uh, and provider. So one of the things in delivery gap is to be looking at how does, how do the conditions, how does the service scape influence, how does the temporary conditions uh, under which the customer operates and also, if it's a temporary condition for the customer and it has an approach avoidance impact, it's a permanent condition for the employee on approach avoid. So these are facets you've got to look into. And this is why services is a holistic event. Because theories and frameworks from earlier in, chap in early chapters come back and engage and connect up into these later models. The communications gap now this one's interesting, uh, particularly now in the rise of social media, Instagram, Facebook, uh, YouTube. You can have people live stream, live blog their service encounter. But the question then becomes, if you are streaming a service encounter, are you, will the communications gap arise from the experience, the, the vicarious experience versus actualized experience. We do know that there are problems in communicating services because they're intangible, inconsistent, inseparable, particularly experiential-based services. Uh, I can always joke about the laser force games being always full of smoke-filled corridors and people in costumes and touched-up special effects. And you go into uh, an environment that doesn't match that and doesn't fit that. And you've been over-promised and they've under-delivered. So one of the challenges you're looking to address here is you've got to balance between making a promise of this is a sort of possible experience you might get versus under-promising of this experience doesn't look terribly interesting. Uh, there's been a lot of problems with movie trailers 
and services and the service gap of communications gap where the movie trailer was more entertaining and more interesting than the movie because the movie trailer only needed two minutes worth of footage uh, to make the excitement pitch and the movie itself needed 90 minutes and didn't quite have the same impact. Finally on the communications gap you've also got the aspect of the gap flows both ways. The retailer's communication about the services influences customer expectation. But it can also influence customer so the service delivery by showcasing, teaching, illustrating how do you engage in the customer service? What are the expectations of co-production, co-delivery that are created in the service communications? It may be that uh, a service communication shows you a resort which looks like a, a open wonderland, a paradise. It's just you and being waited on by half a dozen wait staff. You get there and the place is crowded. It's all self-service. Uh, everyone's rushed off their feet. It's busy. There's a gap. Flip side is that it might be that you're getting this sort of sense of create your own adventure, wander out into the wilderness to only find out that you really carefully, it's a finely tuned, finely go here, observe this for three minutes, move to the next object, carefully structured experience with no freedom, despite the freedom being promised in the ads. So your roles, there may be a gap between the roles that you think you're gonna play based on the advertising content, based on what the people in the ads are doing, what you've seen on social media, and the actual service delivery. Now, all of that brings us down to the diagnostics element of the service gap. And ultimately, it's all about the perception versus the expectation. And what SurfQual does here, SurfQual does 22 pre-event questions, 22 post-event questions. And it does this to calculate the gap score. So ideally, and this is the challenge in service, is you really want to score as close to zero as you can. When the gap score is zero, perceptions have been met. Customers are satisfied. That is the ideal scenario because satisfaction, as we've seen from the previous chapter, leads to loyalty, leads to the development of a, an ongoing commitment to, to repurchase. Now, the reason I say you want to aim for zero is that if you are scoring positive gaps, perceptions exceed expectations, the customer will be happy initially. But the customer is going to eventually track to zero because you're not going to be able to exceed expectation each time. If you're tracking at zero, you're on target. If you're tracking below zero, expectations are greater than uh, what was received, what was perceived, then you are going to need to deal with customer unhappiness and engage in customer redress, service failure and service recovery. But the challenge is to try and stay as close to zero as you can so that you can get a level of consistency. If you are doing delight, if you're getting positive, you are going to be inconsistent because as you can uh, remember from the service gap model, one of the things that will happen is that as the customer expectations increase, your managerial perceptions of what the customer should expect will creep upwards. And this is a particular challenge that shows up where you have different generations of customers, new customers to veteran customers, the expectations that the old hands, the veterans have of the service and management has of the veterans' expectations can sometimes put greater complexity onto a service encounter that 
the old hands know what they're doing and they appreciate uh, a more challenging service. And the rookies are going, this service is below my expectations because I don't know what's going on. The veterans are, this service is making me happy because it's complex and difficult. So you want to watch for this because there are going to be multiple target audiences for whom you need to be running the service gap model. Now in terms of the gaps itself, there are, in terms of the model itself, uh, surf goal, five service dimensions. Now this is variously described, uh, occasionally it's called RATA, where it's reliability, assurance, tangible, empathy, responsiveness. We're going to talk about one, we're going to show you a case one of the scales. Uh, all the scales are in the slide deck, but uh, we're going to look at one of the scales just to discuss it briefly. And this is the idea of reliability. To give you an idea, uh, your framework here, reliability expectations, E5 to E9. Then reliability perceptions, P5 to P9. All of these questions are obviously going to have easy to answer elements. Like the other question you've got to be asking yourself here is what score below five is a customer going to give? Strongly agree to strongly disagree. Oh, so strongly disagree to strongly agree. Where strongly agree is five and strongly disagree is one. When excellent companies keep a promise to do something by a certain time, they will do so. Five? 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 Who's going to say, yeah, look, excellent companies will perform the service right the first time? Three. Uh, mildly agree, neutral, strongly disagree. Then we come down to the reliability perceptions. Uh, it provides the company, XYZ is always replaced by the company you're measuring, provides its services at the time it promises to do so. Scale on the five. Now the challenge here obviously is going to be getting useful and meaningful data out of the, the pre-flight. Um, so perhaps the wordings around excellent companies or a company like XYZ would perform service right the first time. XYZ performed the, performed the service right the first time. So there are criticisms of the surf call uh, scaling and there have been alternatives uh, such as SurfPerf, Surf's Performance Scale, and other scales have been developed. But this is basically to give you an idea of how to do a, an ideal versus an actual. Now, the other thing about the Surf Qual is it is 44 items, and given how people can fade out on a six item scale, it's challenging. Uh, some of the <coughs> some of the aspects to surf call are the five dimensions. Depending on how you're running it and what your stats you run on it, you may find that some of the factors don't load or do load. Uh, there are those aspects of replication. But here's a solid fundamental opening gambit in terms of understanding how something works. The final thing on the surf call is One instrument. It shouldn't be used. It's like the net promoter score. If you use it as the single universal gospel, it's going to fail you because it's not the right tool for that. You are still going to need the service itself, the router measures, and how they tie back to the service gaps. But you're also going to need to do things like service blueprint audits to make certain the service process works. You're going to need to engage your boundary spanners and your frontline staff to gain knowledge from them as to service quality. What is failing? What's the immediate feedback from the customers? What needs work? What has been delivered well? What has to be improvised, modified for delivery? Surf call alone doesn't get the job done. All right, so the last uh, thing I want to talk about here is, is basically tying back to some stuff from market research. Uh, a little bit of stuff out of consumer behavior as well. How do we capture service quality information? I'm just going to briefly talk to the bullet points. Uh, 
Soliciting complaints, high risk. You are asking your customer to think about negative things. Uh, but it also can be a positive in terms of you can bring a customer team in to say, what can we do differently? What can we do better? After sales surveys, uh, basically everyone who's bought a service or consumed a service recently has pro and given out a mobile number has probably had a call seven, three to seven days later of, hi, just touching base to see how satisfied you are with our product. If you've dined it grilled, you're less than a third of the way through your burger. Sometimes you haven't even had a chance to pick your hamburger up and someone will be scooting past going, hi, is that everything from your order? How's the burger going? It's like, the burger is stationary. The burger is fine. Uh, all of these things are qualitative. Uh, what you're, but what your purpose here is to also, uh, in after sales surveys, to reach out and contact a customer at the point in time that they are in the highest point of their cognitive dissonance. Similarly, uh, other data collection points, the you know, interview surveys, focus groups, again, standard methodology for marketers. A really cool one. I'm going to be honest about this. I think this is one of the coolest things we can do in services marketing in terms of data collection. It combines ethnography. It combines um, observational research. The mystery shopper, where a researcher goes to the service provider as a service client and then experiences the service but also documents aspects of the process, particularly uh, around, say, service gap element of delivery standards, of delivery protocols, of other experiences of other customers, of being the other customer. So there's a whole lot of stuff you can learn from mystery shopping. It's also, if you want to do uh, your own service market research on your rivals and you're not that well known to your rival organizations, mystery shopping's the way to go. Uh, employee surveys as well. One of the big things about services is it's skill-based, knowledge-based, and your frontline staff will learn things that are important to you. So you need a means to capture that information to ensure that as they are delivering the actual service, if there are standards that are problems that are difficult to uphold or uh, customers hold expectations above the standards that are set, delivery gap, standards gap, and knowledge gap can often be resolved by engaging your employees as data sources. Also, checking in with your employees and finding out things can bring up new product options, new product opportunities, in services, the employee is incredibly valuable as a member of the organization, as a source of knowledge. So they should be engaged. You should be wanting to retain them, pay them, and trust them to get the job done. And also get that information from them. Final thing uh, is looking at, basically, this is benchmarking. This is external uh, analysis. This is checking that areas of market need have been identified and you're dealing with them. Now, final areas that we want to look about this is in the service information systems, one of the biggest ones is to listen. If the customer perceives a problem, there is a problem or there is the wrong customer. One of the facets in here is that this is very customer centric, customer focused without considering the strategic choice of, do you want that member of the public as one of your clients? So switching back over to seduction for a moment, these might be the other customers who you need to address, deal with, or boot off the service. Yes, you've listened to this person, but their complaints are not valid. And even if their complaint is valid, you don't care because you don't want to deliver the service that they want to provide it. So that's fair, but you've got to make it a strategic and tactical proactive decision to go, this customer is not the customer we want. We're going to get rid of them. 
Uh, Last Element is, in terms of quality, reliability is one of the most important elements of the Rata framework. If you are reliable, you are cashing in consistency. You are delivering what you promise. You can be completely inconsistent, as in a highly custom, highly flexible, highly adaptive service that reliably does that. So it's not a complete contrast, but reliability is customer can get from you the thing that you promise. So the last uh, components here, service design in terms of perception of quality. You're also, there will be some stuff around service recovery a bit later. Uh, essentially, because it's a human interaction, all the rules of human interactions, fair play, equity, equality, and uh, justice apply in service. If somebody in an, and also this is where it's very important that you can determine tiers of customer engagement, because if somebody is sitting in your service and they feel that they're being treated differently or badly, and they feel that they've paid the same price or more, they are going to be resentful and mistrustful because they don't think the service has been fair. At the same time, all of us who've flown economy class can look at first class and go, you are not being treated the same as us, you are not being treated as we are being treated, but that's fair because you've paid the price of a small car to be sitting in that seat. So if there is a structure where fair play can be seen to be even stratified and stratified, it's still the customers will regard it as fair treatment if they can recognize the difference of customer class. And finally, we drag in a little bit of leadership theory from over management, some teamwork from management as well, and some stuff from HR. So as I said, this is a, a holistic subject area that draws on a range of influences, not just the core uh, marketing theories, but also management, HR, and leadership. And that's the serve qual service quality gaps model, rata framework, and means of gathering service information.